this, this field seems a little ill-prepared. So this is a, a presentation that I gave to colleagues on a project that I'm working on now that is um, funded by the Norwegian Research Council. Um, and there's a team of ten, eight of them are from Norway. So this was my presentation which, which was introducing to them why I was a colleague on the on the uh, collaboration. So it talks about the research that I've done into um, factors that affect people's engagements with data visualisation. And it's a summary of lots of findings. So it's not like one detailed paper that focuses on one argument. It tries to give an overview of the range of things that we found. It seemed suitable um, for this moment and, and sort of not repetitive with what I said uh, in the introductory comments. So I worked on this um, project called Seeing Data that lasted for a couple of years. It was funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council and it looked we felt that there was a, a knowledge gap around uh, the factors that affect people's engagements with data visualisations. And we felt that this was important for a couple of reasons. <coughs> One was, as I said in the introductory comments, that most people's main way of getting access to data is through their visual representation, and that there are all sorts of issues around inclusion and inequality in data-driven societies that this raises if we don't understand how people engage. Um, and secondly, in academic research into um, uh, data visualisation, generally it wasn't very user-centred, and when it was, it was a bit like, is the widget better on the left or the right? Let's <laughs> ask five of our MA students. And so we didn't feel that this sort of big million dollar question, does it work, does data visualisation achieve its aims? Uh, was being asked, and especially not in a way that located engaging with visualisations in political, social, economic, cultural contexts. And some research that was done used kind of brain signal, so it, it you know actively tried to cancel out culture. Let's just go straight to the brain and see what's happening when someone looks at a visualisation. And we, we, we found that horrifying, that you know, it could be so decontextualised, the research in this field. So that's what motivated us. And this slide shows a bunch of follow-on projects that have um, arisen from it, which suggests that it is a productive area of research. And it, it came out of the work that I did for this book, which was about ordinary uses of social media data mining, and particularly one of the examples I gave uh, in the introductory comments, the fact that people did respond in a very sort of visceral and positive way when we showed them visual representations of data without really knowing what was going on there. They would, you know, senior people in local councils would say, yes, we definitely want more of that. So it seemed to me that that sort of micro moment of a person looking at a visualisation of data was a very important thing and that we should find out more about what was happening. Um, so there's, yeah, so hence seeing data. Um, the Twitter account is not very active at the moment. Okay, so our questions were these. We were looking at whether it was possible to think about visualisations as effective and in asking that question, we, we felt we needed to think about what we meant by effectiveness and to, to sort of politicise notions of effectiveness and to think about the factors in the making of a visualisation that would affect effectiveness and the factors in the engaging with the visualisation that would also uh, play a role in those processes. So uh, we used all kinds of methods but our methods focused on focus groups. So I, we had 10 focus groups, if I'm remembering <laughs> rightly, having not revised this recently. Um, and we asked people to keep diaries of their encounters with data visualizations in their everyday lives for a week prior to the focus group. And this was to immerse them in the topic. Um, because a lot of people don't know what a data visualisation is. It's, it, you know, it's graphs and charts and maps is probably a more comprehensible phrase to use. So it was about, f 
familiarising people with the visualisations around them um, in order to uh, then be able to really get on with the business of the focus group and not to be spending time um, explaining what it was that we were talking about. Um, so in the focus groups we asked people to look at these eight visualizations which we spent about a million hours choosing um, and you know that we had criteria like a range of uh, subject matters a range of chart types a range of original locations some interactive some static so we tried to cover these grounds and it was very hard to choose and we had very extended discussion about whether visualization A was boring or interesting. Uh, but we ended up with these um, visualizations here. Um, so in summing up what we found, this is basically each of these finding maps onto a paper and, uh, that we've written. And this will be very superficial, but just to kind of give you a uh, sense of the things that were um, arising. So, We've written a paper which is about the factors that affect engagement and that's in the journal First Monday, which is free and online. Um, and what we found was these um, sort of contextualising factors played a role in people's uh, engagements, whether they were willing to engage, how long they engaged. They're kind of not surprising. Um, so that the subject matter makes a difference to someone's willingness to engage in a, with a visualisation isn't, isn't surprising, but it's absolutely <coughs> not on the agenda of data visualisation research. Um, and some, t some papers will talk about users and not tell you what the visualisations were about. And so the subject matter is really not you know, being talked about. So the, even though they're not surprising, these findings, I think they do an important job of putting these issues on the agenda of data viz research. Um, so subject matter mattered, the original source or location mattered, so I don't know what's coming next. <laughs> I haven't got any examples there. So, we, um, so the University of Oxford was a partner um, on the research. They have this organisation called the Migration Observatory and we used migration data which we commissioned some visualisations about um, and some people found that that was a trustworthy brand, the University of Oxford, so they trusted a visualisation whose source was the University of Oxford. Or they would differentiate what we might see as really similar tabloid newspapers. So I trust what I see in the Daily Mirror, I don't trust what I see in the Sun, which for a lot of us are very, very similar UK tabloids. Um, people's original beliefs and opinions mattered, but that wasn't just a question of people liking stuff that confirmed their opinions, people liked stuff that challenged their opinions. So some of the migration uh, stuff challenged one guy's understanding of the history of migration to Britain. He was surprised to see that Irish migrants had dominated for a long time. Um, whether people have got any time available was an important factor. So working mums um, would say, right, at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do is the labour of trying to interpret a data visualisation. So I want to sit down and chill out. And whether people um, felt confident about their skills so a lot of people felt like they either didn't have the statistical skills or they didn't have the visual skills to make sense of the visualisation. So we kind of conclude um, this paper by suggesting that we need to think in broader terms about what an effective visualisation might be. Generally, effectiveness isn't defined, although it is talked about in the literature, and where it is defined, it's defined as speed of comprehension and length of memory. So how quickly you can understand it and how long you can remember it for. And we want to challenge that as a useful definition of effectiveness. We think all of these things listed on the slide here and some more here can all um, be part of a definition of effectiveness depending on your purpose. So newspapers, for example, have very different purposes than more kind of scientific visualisation. We're very much focused on visualisations in the everyday, so that's often in the media or on social media. Um, so as I suggested in the introductory comments, I don't need to uh, dwell on this for long, 
we were really struck by the important role that emotions played in people's engagements with uh, visualizations. Um, and people had emotional reactions to all sorts of elements of the visualization. So visualizations in general, the data contained within them, the visual style, the subject matter, source and confidence and skills. Um, and so, so yeah, with that we wrote a paper that is in the journal Sociology, uh, listed there, called Feeling Numbers, um, which, which kind of builds this argument. Um, so from the point of view of factors in the production process that affect people's engagement, um, we looked at, we, we kind of focused in on the conventions that are used, um, that are available to data visualizers and the role that they play. And because we were interested in the way that visualizations look objective even when their designers have no intention of making them look objective. So we did interviews with visualization designers. A lot of them were fully aware that a visualization prioritizes some data, might prioritize a particular perspective, leave stuff out, and a lot of designers um, ideally would like their audiences to have that kind of critical literacy about the, the process of making a data visualization. So that seemed to contrast with the fact that they seem objective, they seem kind of scientific. So we honed in on the conventions and we made this argument that there are a limited range of conventions that are available. Even in quite experimental visualisation they're often still drawing on this limited range of conventions and that the conventions available in different ways produce this sense of objectivity, of truthfulness. And this is a paper that we wrote in the journal Information, Communication and Society. So we talk about two-dimensional viewpoints, which in Cresson van Leuven's um, terms give you a kind of godlike view, um, so that it is as if you are seeing everything all at once, godlike, and that makes it look like comprehensive and uh, objective. We talked about the use of simple geometric shapes, which creates a sense of order, and there we also draw on some visual comm scholars arguing that, that simple shapes do that. We talked about the use of clean layouts, which create a sense of simplicity, and we're saying that these things kind of rub off on the data. So the layout is simple and that makes the data seem sort of simple, clear and uncluttered. But, you know, we're, the visualisation is showing the facts, telling it like it is. And we also talked about the use of data sources, which are there so that we can go and look at the data and verify the origins of a visualisation, which I imagine a lot of people don't do because a lot of people wouldn't be able to make sense of the raw data. But they create a sense of transparency. They, they communicate a message, you can trust us, uh, you know, we're showing you where, where we came from to this visualisation, you can trust that we um, have been truthful to the data here. <coughs> so our argument here is that these conventions produce this sense of objectivity, um, even if that's not what designers intend. Okay, so... Um, one of the visualisations that we used, now one of our criteria that I forgot to mention was that we didn't want all of the visualisations to be good. And this is one that for us fitted that criteria of a not necessarily good visualisation. So it visualises the social media followers of Shakira and Rihanna. And it's bad in various ways. There's no key to tell you how to make sense of the visualisation. Because one of them is surrounded by pink and the other is surrounded by orange, you might think that all the orange visuals relate to one and that all the pink visuals relate to the other. But in fact, um, all, of the visual, all of the data relates to Shakira, apart from the one that's got an arrow popping out from Rihanna over there. Um, there's issues around size. So here, 26 million. Uh, Twitter followers occupies pretty much the same amount of space as 101 million Facebook followers. So there's various things that, in professional terms, make it not a good visualisation. But we were really struck by the gendered derision um, of this um, visualisation. And we felt that the fact that there are kind of 
um, fairly objective professional measures that aren't being met here was used to kind of make invisible some fairly sexist discourse about the visualisation. On this paper I worked with Isabel Gerard, who, whose work has looked very much of, on um, a gendered derision of the popular cultural icons of young women. Um, <coughs> this, it came from the Metro, which is a free paper. Didn't even have a title. We called it The Clicks Don't Lie because it, it comes here. But the visualisation didn't. Um, and yeah, so uh, our argument in, in this paper is that um, the kind of responses to this visualisation can be seen as a form of flexible sexism, which is a term from Rosalind Gill about how sexism can, um, you know, is adapted to particular situations and is often uh, made invisible by other kind of discourses that are around. So it wasn't our intention to study gender or to write a paper about gender, but it struck us as noteworthy, so, so we did. And now this paper, um, while we were researching visualisations, me, uh, me and Rosie Hill, who was the postdoc on the project, went to a lot of conferences where we felt we were seeing a lot of presenters say, as you can see in the graph, um, a point to something that you definitely couldn't see in the graph, what people were saying you could see in the graph. And uh, so the paper was originally called As You Can See in the Graph, but uh, we changed the name. Because I've, I suppose I felt a little bit like that title um, put the responsibility for a bad visualisation on the academic. And what we argue in the paper, actually, is that the neoliberal conditions of academia have forced force us all to become expert data visualisers today. Last year we had to be expert social media analysts. Two years before we had to be expert social media self-marketers. So this sort of individualising, responsibilising subject of the neoliberal academia was the reason that people were saying, as you can see in the graph, and we didn't understand what it was that they were talking about. So this kind, this kind of contextualises that phenomenon in the, the sort of political context of work. But it also highlights that there's a lot of pleasure, in, not just in consuming visualisation, in um, producing it as well. And, and this again draws on an article by uh, Rosalind Gill, um, the name escapes me, but it's about neoliberal academia. And she talks about how, uh, you know, our academic work often is part of a bigger advocacy or activism project. Um, and so academics are wanting to use visual representations of what they do to engage publics to, to kind of do political work. So there are pleasures in that. It's not just all about neoliberal self-repression. There you go, as you can see in the graph. Um, here's some graphs that um, I'm going really fast in case you recognize them. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, that kind of uh, sums up um, uh, the articles that we've written anyway we've done a lot of uh, blog posts and podcasts um, and you can find everything on our seeing data website and it's led us to um, well yeah part of the seeing data website is a guide to data viz literacy for people that don't know anything about data viz but want to know more that's been kind of quite well received so you can check that out it comes under this developing visualization literacy heading um, uh, yeah, and there are various other projects that are following on from it. So that's a whistle stop, <laughs> unprepared tour through uh, seeing data research. Okay. So, so my name is Nick Debra. Um, I'm, I'm uh, private sector, so it's going to be a little bit of a change of pace, uh, not an academic. Um, I work for a, a vast multinational consultancy called Perceptual Edge. We have a headcount of three, as you can see here. Um, it was founded about, uh, about 12 years ago by Steve Few. Has anybody come across? Yeah, I just mentioned him. Oh, okay, sorry. Well, I was busy with you, I heard, I heard yeah. Tufty, but uh, yeah, so Steve is my colleague. I've been working with him for about three or four years and teaching his courses uh, um, uh, privately, and I'm actually going to be teaching them publicly as well uh, by the end of the year. 
And so uh, this is a talk that I've, I've done uh, a couple of times. I've done in a little while. But it's, it's basically targeted. Oh, sorry, just some of the books that Steve has, uh, has written. I teach all over the world, uh, mostly uh, private sector, large organizations, Fortune 1000s, but I also teach government, uh, nonprofits, uh, charities when I can. I love to do that kind of work. And this is a talk that basically uh, it's called you know, how, to, how to Lie with Grass by Accident. So the idea is to sensitize people of uh, various skill levels, uh, including people who actually are very experienced data analysts, about how easy it is to accidentally mislead your audience, even when you're trying to be uh, as honest as possible. You know, I mean, actually, I'm going to touch on a number of things that you're talking about. And so, um, you know, I, I start by saying that, uh, you know, this is actually, has anybody come across this book? It's quite a famous book, How to Lie with Statistics. It came out in 1954. It's an old book. And it really illustrates well that by now most people realize that, in fact, it's quite easy to um, tell whatever story you want with statistics. You know, everybody in this room, of course, knows that pretty, pretty well. You cherry pick your methods, you cherry pick your data. By now, most people are also pretty well aware that uh, it's very easy to mislead people uh, deliberately uh, using graphs, right? And so this is an ad for a medication called Crestor, which is a lipid-lowering agent. As you can see, the designers use a bunch of dirty tricks to, um, to mislead the audience in terms of making certain values look maybe look higher than others when they're not necessarily as high as the others. Or, or you know, this, this uh, reference line here, for example, I bet you this is completely arbitrary and it makes this look sort of more important. So most people, well, I don't know, I don't know about most people, but a lot of people are, are starting to become aware of how easy it is. They're starting to actually distrust graphs because they know how easy, or easy it is to misrepresent the underlying data with them. That's great. <laughs> what a, a lot of people, or far fewer people rather, realize is how easy it is to mislead people by accident, where you're not trying to mislead anybody, you're trying to be as truthful as possible, and yet you create a graph where if you were to show it to somebody and then quiz them afterwards about it, you know, in terms of what was the underlying data saying, you would get mocky answers, right? Say, well, you know, how, how, how much more do you think this quantity is than that quantity? Uh, about twice as much. Oh, oh no, the data actually shows it's five times as much. But I wasn't trying to deceive anybody. I wasn't trying to lie. And so this actually happens um, in all forms of communication, right, where you're trying to say something, but they end up saying something else that you weren't necessarily intending to say, like, like in this example. Or here. Right, so this happens in spoken communication, happens in written communication, also happens with graphs. Largely for the same reason, right? It's, it's just a question of training. You know, you have to know the basic best practices, the basic common mistakes, so that you don't, you know, you don't make these mistakes in your own communication. So I like to, you know, obviously I can't talk about all the ways that, that people can lie with graphs. Um, that would be impossible because, like writing, there are virtually, you know, an unlimited number of ways that you could uh, potentially lie with graphs. So I'm just going to talk about a couple. And like I said, the idea is just to sensitize people that you know how easy it is to uh, to do this. And I'm going to do, do that through a couple of scenarios, a couple of stories. And so the first scenario is is we're in our, an organization. Uh, we have five regional offices, and we've recently collected some employee satisfaction data. And uh, and so uh, I'm maybe on on the, the the BI team of the organization. And I've been asked to, um, to 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 visualize this, uh, and so I do something like this. So here we have you know, uh, average employee satisfaction out of ten. These are our five regional offices. Okay, you know, uh, kind of interesting, but a little boring. They're all around eight. And in fact, the values are so close together that it's actually kind of hard to see the differences between them. So why don't I make it actually easier to see the differences uh, between these and only show the part of the scale that goes from about 7.5 to 8.5? Let's try that. Oh, yeah. OK. Much easier to see the differences. Looks kind of more exciting. Um, and so you're happy with this. You send this to the management meeting, which happens uh, the same day, but then you get this furious phone call from the manager of the central office, the regional manager, going like, I just got a call from the CEO and he chewed me out because he said that the, you know, the employee satisfaction of my regional office was less than half. 
of the others. <laughs> you know, like, what did you send him? Right? And of course, this is a graph that appeared on, you know, in a report that had like mm -hmm. 15 other graphs and a bunch of tables and numbers, and they didn't, you know, it's very easy to not, you know, not notice, not realize that this doesn't start at zero, right? And you know, because as, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware, and probably lots of people in this room. There's lots of research showing that when, when people see bars like this, their eyes start comparing the lengths of those bars before they even realize what they're looking at, right? So the first thing they notice is that this is, whatever the hell this is, is a lot less than all these other things before they even realize that they're looking at employee satisfaction data or regional offices or anything else. And so, uh, you know, but of course, uh, a major news organization would never make a mistake like that, right? It's from Fox News from a couple of years ago talking about what would happen if the Bush tax cuts expire and you know it's just it's in the Obama years. Oh my god, I our taxes are going up by what six hundred percent, right? It's terrible. And of course, you know, especially because this was on TV, nobody looks at anything closely on TV, you know. I'm sure ninety percent of the people who saw this thought that, you know, yeah, like this you know, we're gonna be paying six times more taxes if we allow this to happen. Um, but at least you know when this happened, the uh, you know the good news was that the the outcry, the pushback was so strong with this that they never ever did it again. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they they put out this right. So here, talking about you know, when when the federal government was trying to get people to sign up for Obamacare, only four days to the deadline. Barely a third of the way there. <laughs> All right. Well, at least they put the numbers in to make it clear that they were they were lying, or make it a little bit more obvious that they were lying. Uh, and then Saturday Night Live, you guys know, all know Saturday Night Live. They actually, a couple of days after the deadline had passed, they, they put this up, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> so uh, you know, I think that this is kind of well summarized actually by uh, by this graph which I created. Sort of explain the basic best practice here. <laughs> Somebody suggested I put this on a T-shirt. Maybe I won't make me wrong. All right, another scenario. So here we are, uh, an investment company, and so our investment philosophy is that, uh, or our strategy rather, is that we want to be invested equally in all sectors of the economy. And so I get uh, my BI person to, to tell me, is that the case? You know, how are our, you know, our investments distributed? Produces this. Great. Mission accomplished, right? We are almost perfectly equally distributed across all various sectors of the economy. Now, you know, just for fun, and admittedly I have perhaps an odd idea of what is, what is fun, uh, I'm a, I, I decide to take this data and render it as a bar graph. Oh. Same data, different story, right? These values are not all the same. In fact, they're quite different. They range from about 14% to about 18%, which is quite a big difference. You know, the larger one is about a quarter larger than, than the smallest. And oh my god, we completely forgot to invest in telecom, which is not obvious at all from this pie chart. Okay? And so there are there are perceptual issues around pie charts, very controversial, as I'm sure <laughs> some of you know. People have you know very passionate arguments about this, but there are you know there are some pretty serious limitations. I won't go as far as Steve and say that you never ever use them, but you got to be aware of the limitations when when you do for sure. All right, another scenario. So this time, we work for a, uh, a large hospital. And just like all large hospitals, or, or hospitals of any size, we are concerned about uh, the rate of hospital-acquired infections, right? This is a common thing, unfortunately, that happens. You go in a hospital, it's full of people who have all sorts of infections, and you end up catching one of them. Big problem. And so um, you do some, uh, you've got, a, uh, you're on the, the management team, you do some research that you want to bring to the management meeting to basically answer the question, are we investing enough in solving this problem? And so you do your research, and you come up with this. So you've decided to show this as a, as a dual axis chart. And here on this axis, we have the rate of hospital acquired infections for the last 12 months, as represented by this kind of pink salmon line. 
And uh, on this axis, we have uh, our, our investments, how much we're spending to try and fight this problem. And so you bring this to, uh, to the manager meeting and, uh, and, and you know, explain that I think we're actually doing OK, right? Yes, this is a problem, but it's increasing very, very slowly. And our rate of investment is increasing much faster. I think we're OK. We might even want to curb the amount of expenses. So we, we're, not, we're not increasing our, our investments in this problem quite so much. We might be over investing a little bit. And, uh, you know, and just as you finish saying this, though, Frank gets up from the other side of the table. Frank, who's gunning for your job? <laughs> and he says, you know, actually, I did the same research, but you know, I came up with something that's a little bit different. And so he starts distributing this other graph that looks a lot like yours, but not quite the same, right? Same dual axis chart. Mm -hmm. But Frank's graph is saying that, uh, well, actually, the, the, the rate of hospital acquired infections is shooting up, and our costs are barely keeping pace. Right? <laughs> And so, you know, but you, you worked very careful in your research, right? Well, you know, you, you, you sort of counter say, well, Frank, I'm sorry, but I think your data must be wrong, right? And so it's like, well, no, I don't think so. So you compare data and you realize that it's actually the same data, identical, no difference at all. And so, uh, but obviously they're telling that they, you know, different stories, right? How is this possible? Different scales. Right? And so you might have been using two different software packages because unfortunately software, different software assigns scales in different ways. There are different algorithms to do this. Your graph goes from 0 to 100 hospital acquired infections per month. The Frank's graph goes to 65 to 90. Your graph on this axis goes from 135,000 to 155,000. His graph goes from 100 to 180. And so same data, totally different story. Right? In fact, almost polar opposite story. So who thinks that who thinks that your graph is more truthful? Who thinks that Frank's graph is more truthful? I think they're both illegitimate. They're both yeah. wrong. They both, both wrong? I agree. <laughs> I agree. I think they're both wrong. Yeah. If you really wanted to compare the rates of change of these two variables, this would not be a good way of doing it. I think they're both they're both wrong, basically. You you know, something like this, there's several ways of doing this, of course. This would be a good way, or uh, one way of doing it where you, know, you might peg January, the first month of the period, as, as 0%, and then show percentage difference in the subsequent months. And so here, I can see that, for example, in July, uh, the rate of hospital acquired infections is about 13% higher than it was in January. And so this, this is actually more, you know, I wouldn't say more to it is truthful. And so, yes, the real rate of increase of hospital acquired infections is faster than Costs. And so if our goal is to keep pace, then you know we should increase the amount of spending that we're, we're doing. All right, uh, last, I think it's the last scenario. So here we're, we're an e-commerce company, and like all e-commerce companies, we keep a close eye on our metrics. We might have a dashboard or something that looks like this. And so I, as the person who is responsible for these metrics, immediately notice that today uh, we, you know, our orders are doing really well. Holy crap. Eight and a half percent over yesterday. That almost never happens. That's a huge change. And so you're pretty pleased about this. In fact, you're so pleased that you go to your manager and you, and, and you tell her, I say, look, you know, I think things are going really well, right? She's suitably impressed. Yes, absolutely. You know, great job. Um, I want to see, though, is this, uh, you know, uh, how long has this, this upward trend been happening? Is this a recent thing? Is it a longer term thing? And so you sit down, you look at the last 14 days. Ah, crap. That's not good. So that first graph is a very extremely simple graph, a little trend indicator, was definitely lying. It was showing a strong upward trend for this metric, which is definitely not the case. And so, uh, so now, actually, she's kind of upset. And in fact, so upset, she said, look, I think it's a real problem. We've got to bring this to, uh, to senior management. Um, but before we do that, I want more context around this problem. I want to know when did this slide start? Go back and look further in the data. So you're kind of bummed out. Go back to your desk and say, OK, how about, I don't know, 140 days instead of 14? <laughs> well, come on. What, like, what the hell's going on? Well, this is, this is experiencing a kind of cycle, right? Where it looks like a monthly cycle. Maybe at the beginning of the month is where we send out our 
newsletter with all our specials or something like that. And I just happen to be looking at the last little bit. And so indeed, the last, both of these visualizations were actually lying. And you see these period to period comparisons all the time, uh, especially in business, and they are almost always misleading, right? They're just showing you noise from one period to the next, and yet very, very common. Oh, sorry, one more scenario. So this graph, which is showing the, the monthly headcount of our organization, is actually lying. Can anybody see? It's, it's, it's not obvious. It's, it's lying in a very subtle way. I'll give you a hint. Look, look at November. November. <laughs> Looks like it's missing uh, a data point. Yeah, it might be missing a data point, right? We're not sure, right? If I were to mark off right. the data points with points, then I would actually see that, yes, indeed, it is actually missing something. I'm not saying you should always add markers. I'm just showing that to, uh, to indicate that this graph is lying, right? Because for all we know, reality could look like this. Mm -hmm. It might look like that. And those are entirely different stories, right? And yet, unfortunately, the default behavior for a lot of software packages is join across the gap. And that's long, right? It's saying that we know something that, in fact, we don't know, right? And that's, that's not good. Now, at least it didn't look like this, <laughs> which, unfortunately, some software still, still does. The unknown, unknown value treated as zero, right? But I, I, in a way, this is almost better, because it's very obvious that something's wrong, at least. At least we know it's lying. I've seen it, uh, this problem solved this way. I personally don't like it because this looks like an estimate or a projection, but you know, that we have some idea of what happened in November, but really we don't, right? And so this, this would be a much safer way of, of handling. This is what we know, what we don't know. This is much more, much more uh, truthful. So like I said, you know, this is just a, a, a smattering, just a taste. It's really designed to, you know, th this talk is designed to just sensitize audiences to the fact that this is, a, you know, an important skill set that you, you know, if you're creating graphs, especially graphs that on which important decisions will be made, take a bit of time and learn the basics, learn the fundamentals. It's not rocket science. Uh, I do, you know, one-day workshops, for example, where I can sort of teach the basics and get people out of making these, you know, really basic mistakes at least. Um, and unfortunately, it's, you know, but it's not the only reason why graphs fail, too. Graphs can be misleading. They can also be ambiguous, where you show the same graph to two different people, and they come up with two different understandings of what's happening. That's not good. Esoteric, where, uh, actually, yeah, we were talking about this before, where you're showing graph, you know, of, of the scatter plot to people who don't understand how to read scatter plots, or dual axis to people who don't understand how to read dual axis, which is surprisingly common, even in senior decision makers who I deal with. Graphs that are overwhelming, too many stories going on, too many data series, something needs to be broken apart or organized better. Uh, unobvious, where if this graph is supposed to tell me something or get me to do something, it's not obvious what it is. What action am I supposed to take based on this? Occlusive, especially the 3D graphs where you have uh, bars behind bars, lines behind lines, right? So it's not lying, it's just that I know that there's something I'm not seeing, I just can't see what it is. And coherent, this is actually a really important one, where, you know, the first impression of your graph shouldn't conflict with subsequent understanding, right? So we saw an example of that before, uh, where actually, sorry, I guess I can up. But where you know your first impression might be like, oh my god, things are going horribly. But then you look at it for another ten seconds and like, oh no, 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 that's, that's wrong. Things are actually okay. That shouldn't happen. The first impression should be consistent with subsequent understanding. It doesn't mean that you should understand the graph at a glance, but. You know, your first impression, like I said, shouldn't conflict with subsequent understanding. Uh, I'll skip over that. Ugly. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be beautiful, but if it's ugly, then people pay attention to how ugly it is. And then they're thinking about that instead of the data. Mm -hmm. Not good. And in fact, I really want to read your research because I think that's very interesting. Another books, a blog. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, um, mostly for semantic reasons, what I'm going to say has nothing to do with either of those two presentations. So we've just been talking about um, visual graph, graphs in terms of graphs and charts, visualizations. I want to talk to you today about computer science graphs, which are indeed a form of representation, but um, I won't be focusing on their visuality at all. There will be visuals, but I'm not going to be focusing on their visuality at all. Rather, I'm going to be talking about their kind of 
internal logics of reasoning, or the ways the ways in which computer science graphs um, structure our capacity to think and act in the world. Um, so I recognize that the, the title of my talk is not especially catchy. So let me put what I want to share yeah. is in simpler terms with you um, by starting with the basic asser assertion that there is philosophy at work in our graphs, in these computer gra science graphs that I'm going to be describing. So when it comes to the circulation of power alongside empirical and critical analyses of the datafied relationships between groups and corporations, technologists, scientists, all the different groups that we've been hearing about today in the state, we need to be thinking about the underlying representational strategies that help to constitute and reproduce those relationships in the first place. So I'm going to talk about the sort of philosophies of relationality is sort of what I'm going to be talking about today. So with my time today, I want to sort of highlight certain connections between academic philosophy and our conceptualizations of data as they encounter one another through theories of the sign. So it's a kind of semiotic argument that I'm sort of talking about today. The idea is that by examining information systems and platforms and how they rely on philosophy when conceptualizing their practices, the idea is that we can, get greater, we can gain greater insight into the circulating effects and consequences of data power. As I say, the main figure that I want to rely on to do this is what's known in computer science as a directed graph. So this, at their most, uh, basically, computers function at their, at, at their most abstract. Graphs are there to sort of say this, and then this, and then this in the computer, or to say this, or this, or this, or this in the computer. Very basic formal abstraction at, right at the heart, or right at the root of computing. Um, so you'll, but you'll probably recognize them visually as network style diagrams that treat things, people, and documents as interconnected nodes, which relate to one another via edges or lines of relation between those nodes. And what I'm primarily interested in are the conceptual details behind how these lines of relation actually purport to relate at the level of technique in computer science and information systems. These underlying justifications matter, I think, because directed graphs can operate according to multiple and different representational approaches in order to bring these things into relation. Uh, but before getting into the details, let me first say a word about the generic power of graphs. When combined with algorithms, directed graphs are what allow for the very rapid and flexible pairwise comparison of everything represented within their network. So it's a very rapid way of sort of comparing things together. I just want to sort of give you a few concrete applications uh, of, of graphs here today. So one of them is the traveling sales um, problem in computer science. Uh, and this problem is about formalizing streets and roads into a directed graph, into a kind of network, in order to calculate the shortest distance between them for any given trip. So UPS, for instance, has controversially begun to delegate driver judgment about optimal routes in the city, tra in city traffic to its what it calls its Orion tool, which relies on graph theory to calculate and plot counterintuitive delivery patterns, which will purportedly save the company millions in fuel costs. So this is one example of an application of graph theory. A second example is the analysis of friendship and social interaction via directed graph to discover who acts influentially upon whom as a so-called bridging tie between social groups. So here, directed graph theory has been applied in the social sciences since the 1940s, but is lately being used to analyze groups of voters to determine influential people who might sway undecided voters, and to analyze terrorist group activity to try and predict leadership structures and meeting behavior. And of course, finally, in the late 1990s, Google's PageRank algorithm famously began to use automated web crawlers to record hyperlinks between pages, which it could then analyze as one big, enormous directed graph. The approach was innovative for calculating what the web found significant through its own networks of interrelation. So it was able to actually sort of induce a kind of global relevance from out of the interactions by, by from out of the interactions of web pages by sort of treating the entire web as a directed graph. Now, to get a still broader sense of the social role that graphs now play in everyday life, we can also turn to Sir Tim Berners-Lee's somewhat more stylized conception of global graphs. Back in 2007, he and collaborator James Hendler were discussing the future of the web in terms of what they called the rise of social machines. So here's a quote from Berners-Lee. Quote, the net and the web may both be shaped as something mathematicians call a graph, but they are at different levels. The net links computers, the web links documents. Now people are making another mental move. There is realization now it's not the documents, it is the things they are about which are important. Obvious, really. Biologists are interested in proteins, drugs, genes. Business people are interested in customers, products, sales. We are all interested in friends, family, colleagues, and acquaintances, unquote. Right? So give you a sense of the sort of social role that graphs play. So in other words, graphs aren't just about solving optimization problems. They're also a general medium through which we reason socially in communication. Ten years on from their original vision, it feels entirely commonsensical to say that we do now indeed live in an age of social machines. 
We don't think twice about asking Siri or Google for the capital of Bulgaria to name some actor in an old movie or to book a dinner date with a friend. Uh, and these all involve directed graphs. But for the purposes of understanding how power circulates through data, we need to be more precise in our thinking to ask, how exactly are we defining the social as a collective relation such that it can include machines? And how, and, and as a sort of question of, sort of a, more, a more critical question still would be to say, how might we want to redefine our relationship to machines in terms of our sociality with machines, uh, in terms of the frustrations of the ways in which the concept of the social itself has been co-opted or commodified or sort of instrumentalized? Um, implied in Hendler and Berners-Lee's narrative is one answer, which is to say that we are social over machines insofar as they help us make efficient sense of our world communicatively or through a pragmatics of intersubjective recognition. Right, so this is the way that we think about the social generally. Uh, we sort of say, well, it's me talking to another person. Uh, it's a self-another relationship. And sometimes it's a slightly, it's sometimes it's a self-another relationship with machines. So we've lately, we've been sort of shifting to accommodate both human beings and machines as agents who engage in shared meaning making. So the rise of social AI and chatbots like Siri, Facebook M, and services like Amazon Alexa are just the late exa latest example of thinking about sociality in this way. And again, not coincidentally, all of these products involve some combination of directed graphs to achieve their conversational functionality. And so we can say, you know, should we be satisfied to say that communication and knowledge production have simply converged on a socio-technical self and other model of design? That's one way to sort of answer the question. Another is to sort of press the notion of social machines in a more theoretical direction to say that web-connected devices and platforms are not simply social in terms of organizing efficient communication. They are also playing a socializing role in wider assemblages that configure sociality on the basis of knowledge production and economic value. Here we need to bear in mind, as Alexander Monin argues, that knowledge in a knowledge economy, quote, no longer denotes to any norm or domain of knowledge, but rather betokens a broad assimilation to a commodity, essentially cultivated in order to sustain growth. As people like Berardi, Lazzarato, and Gnosco have elsewhere indicated, we live in an age of semio-capitalism, right? So under the auspices of us sort of um, producing knowledge and communicating with one another, we have to bear in mind that there is also a kind of commodity relation that's coming baked in with this technical relation. And so to get at these deeper combinations of communication and value, we need to set aside the assumption that it is communicating reasoning subjects who sit at the center of today's social machine relations. And here, I, in a lot of ways, I'm following Deleuze and Guattari's assemblage approach. When we make this assumption, so th their argument is that when we make this assumption that, 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 um, that semiotics is, is, is predominantly or only about communicating subjects, and that we, what, what happens is we wind up taking the social to exist as a kind of transcendental substance of communication between us. And what they argue is that we lose sight of what we call the machinic or the asignifying elements that make up a particular assemblage. So that their argument is basically, uh, we mistakenly assume that, that signs are simply about human beings communicating. In fact, there's a kind of lower stratum of, of semiotics that they call asignifying signs that are actually productive of those relations that we can call social. And we need to go down into that register in order to see what's going on. And I argue that we sort of need to do this with graphs as well. Could you give an example? Uh, an ex so a credit card would be a good example, right? So we have a set of uh, cultural uh, sort of practices around credit cards, and yet it is sort of the materiality of like the iron oxide particles in the card itself that are setting up imperatives with the computer that have nothing to do with meaning, right? So that it's just kind of like, this is a, a material layer that we're sort of organizing to, to look like zero, to stipulate as zeros and ones, or as, dig, as digital information. And it's that materiality that we want to get at when we talk about uh, representation in its totality. Like I say, it's the sort of to the technical level that we must turn in order to see these machinic elements at work. And it's obviously, and it, coincidentally, it's here that we're in the best position to see how directed graphs organize the conditions of possibility for sociality in their articulation of the computable to the meaningful. Uh, Gadal Langlois, who's here in the room, her closely related notion of meaning machines gets at the important difference uh, as when she writes, quote, whereas meaning has been traditionally seen as the human mind constructing an understanding of the world, we now have to consider the relationship between human and meaning as much more complex. Meaning is not a direct imposition from the human mind onto a reality, but rather something that is shaped by the materials and techniques used to produce it, unquote. The weird irony here, though, is that if we are to generally pass through the looking glass in the manner that Langlois is suggesting, then we will actually need to go back 
to these constructivist theories of mind and meaning and understanding, the ones that we sort of that are sort of driving this assumption that it's people talking to each other or people sort of it's strictly minds interacting with each other and coming to coming coming together under shared meaning, we have to go back to these notions with <coughs> a more critical eye, because they're not just abstract theories that are circulating <coughs> in philosophical debates. They're actually the very models upon which we conceive of data itself. So combining through various levels of human computer action, protocol, and algorithm design, the models of thinking, in a sense, are coming baked into the material processes of datification that we seek to evaluate and criticize. All right, so that's all, that's all fairly abstruse, and I, that's my style, it's the, way, it's the way I roll. So uh, what I'll try to do next is sort of get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more concrete to sort of describe what I'm talking about here. So, here are a few different ways in which graphs function. So there's sort of representational strategies for the computer to sort of go, I can, I can move here, I can move there, I can move here, in terms of a process, uh, in, in terms of information processing. And we sort of stipulate structures of meaning over top of this according to different strategies. So knowledge graphs, for instance, they set up a kind of logicist relation for us to be social with one another through data. They incentivize us to communicate with one another in terms of making factually correct or incorrect reference to things in the world. Social graphs, same thing. The computer is there going and, 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 or, or, and, and, and. And overlaying on top of that, we use, we take theories from philosophy that are performative in nature. And we assume that it's actually about uh, again, this, this notion of human beings doing things together. Rather than us sharing facts which may or may, may or may not be correct, it's rather people doing things together in such a way that they define themselves as belonging or not belonging to a community. And that's sort of how social graphs function. A third and more recent development is machine learning graphs, I mean, they're not that recent, but um, which are really interesting and sort of fascinating in the sense that they that they really do um, sort of start from the, rather than starting from some kind of sense of us being social through logic or us being social through performance, they begin from, by saying, screw all that. We're actually, what all we're doing is, when we're doing, when we're engaged in this behavior, what all we're doing is sort of, we're emitting signals that we can actually read as kind of like neuronal signals that we can just pass into a neural net and just be not concerned with social meaning whatsoever and just allow the kind of computer to take over and set up predictive conditions for, our, for us to anticipate our world according to the predictions. And so each of these are, I sort of want to describe these as different styles of graph that articulate sociality to the capacity of computation in one way or another. Just to say a little bit more about where this, where this material comes from, so where it's rooted in philosophy as a way of causing it to work or causing it to sort of function well. So the philosophical outlook of knowledge graphs has to do with rationalism. It has to do with uh, a certain moment in 20th century logical empiricism. It has to do with Percy and semiotics, which, which was about kind of how, how can we bootstrap um, our sensations up into the things that we say, up into the culture and, and, le and sort of legislative symbolic codes that we set up in a society, how can we bootstrap these various levels in a way that fits together with logic? And he, he basically was um, it's just brilliant in sort, of, in sort of establishing a kind of system, and his semiotics are basically driving, in a lot of ways, how we think about knowledge graphs today. Other figures that matter here are people like the early, or the work of the early uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, people like Gottlob Frege, who were trying to think about uh, sort of reconciling or consolidating logic and mathematics together so that we could understand when we, so that when we talk to each other, we could speak in logical terms. What you get, if, so if we're to say that these, if these are ideas about knowledge and that we, we take them up in our devices now as a kind of mode of being subjectivated, what we get is the kind of pragmatics of sense and reference, where I have, to, in order for me to be social with you, I, I'm sort of accepting the norms of logic. I'm accepting the norms that, uh, that, that something that we can determine that something will be factually valid together. And projected into machines, it's enabling, obviously, a lot of really rich affordances for us in terms of things like Siri today. But in terms of precursors, relational databases are based in Persian semiotics. Uh, what's called good old-fashioned AI or knowledge engineering itself was also based in sort of the, the ideas of, of Russell, uh, Frege, and Peirce, um, expert systems as we thought about them in the 1980s. What we get from this account is what you could say is a transcendentally objectivist approach to the sign, right? So it's about seeing the world in logical terms. Social graphs take a different perspective, and in fact, they take a perspective 
that comes out of criticisms of the logical empiricists, right? Or, or it, that come out of criticisms of the way that Frege thought about la the way that language and logic fit together. Because so, what people like the later Wittgenstein, people like J. L. Austin, John Searle, uh, they all sort of were sort of proteges of Frege, if you like, uh, but realized that they were missing that what was missing from Frege's ideas were the performative dimensions of. Uh, of thinking and acting in the world. The fact that it's not just logic that holds us to norms, there are actually performative dimensions that only human beings can do. So I pronounce you married, right? It's not a logical relation. It's a performative relation between people in a social context. And so from out of this, you get a kind of a, a, an opportunity to sort of formal, well, let's, let's not formalize things via logic. Let's formalize things via a pragmatics of what so called illocutionary force. So the fact that when I'm speaking to my boss, I can't say certain things to my boss because there is a, a kind of context of illocutionary force, and that's it's those social performance relations that actually um, that are actually what matter in terms of organizing knowledge and organizing a community sort of simultaneously. And so, and again, I'm sort of glossing here. So what? So there there are arguments that come into computer science from out of people like Searle, who proposed a kind of typology of illocutionary force that was taken up in groupware and computer supported cooperative work. You have people that criticized that uh, maneuver, so people like Richard Sessman, who came along and sort of said, well, actually, we should turn to ethnomethodology and sort of say it's actually just the analytics of the conversations themselves as they unfold that we should be using to drive how computer science graphs fit together rather than, uh, rather than any typology. So I, I won't linger on it too much, but the idea is that you get a sort of transcendentally subjectivist approach to design, where the world is understood as a kind of social substance. There's an example here. This is a very early example of, of performativity uh, in uh, a, a piece of software called the Coordinator, where we would sort of where illocutionary force replaces facts and, and logic and knowledge as a way of sort of modeling graphs. Finally, I have a sense I'm running out of time. So, what we're dealing with today is um, a turn to British empiricism. So, people are AI and machine learning practitioners are turning to uh, the work of David Hume and British empiricism uh, to sort of say. Why should we? We should not bother having a transcendental account of this, uh, to the sign at all. What we should be doing instead is assuming that the, our relationship to signs is made up entirely of impressions that we have in the mind. So as I'm sort of passing through experiences, as I'm passing through life, uh, I'm I'm undergoing different sensations, and those sensations are resonating in me and causing me to sort of uh, make associations in the world. And so, again, still by relying on this sort of uh, logic, this very abstract logic of graphs, um, people are articulating Hume's ideas to um, to graphs. And um, let me just figure out what the last thing is worth saying here. Um, okay, so what I'll, I'll finish off just with some of the consequences, right? So the idea is, so it, taking all of these ideas in mind in the context of saying that there is a kind of machinic layer and a signifying layer made up of these made up of these graph structures, um, the idea is that as it stands right now, we are concerned about the machinic layer. A lot of people that are speaking here in the conference are concerned about the machinic layer in terms of thinking critically about existing systems. So how do how does algorithmic accountability work? In how does the machinic layer of the algorithm? Um, bake in certain ethics uh, in terms of the way we approach data. Uh, the worries about introducing bias into machine learning, the ways in which social media may promote fake news. These are all concerns, at, as in a certain register, they are concerns over the machinic layer as doing things that we don't want it to do. But the idea is that we shouldn't necessarily be hemmed in by the notion that data is strictly about information to be retrieved. It's also a medium through which we express ourselves and relate to one another. And so the idea is that we should be looking at the machinic strategies not just in terms of criticizing them, but also in terms of a, a relationship to form or a design relationship where we might sort of say, okay, well, if it is, if it's the if if the machinic layer and the layer of meaning or the communication between self and other that, that they, we, they they sort of fit together in a particular way, what would it mean to sort of become more reflexive about them in the ways that we it, so we've, we've used philosophy to kind of articulate th them together so far? What would it mean to kind of pull them apart? be reflexive about life with the internet and bring in new styles of philosophy that would reconfigure that relationship between the machinic layer and the layer of communication. Um, I have some ideas about that I'd like to talk about in the Q&A, but maybe I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Thank you.